hearing from the next two speakers and now we do have with us Mr. Richard Pivis. He is the chairman of CLSA Capital Partners Hong Kong and he will be telling us more about Asian corporations in the global market. Now Mr. Richard has studied and worked in the Asian region since the early 1970s. He is a former CIO of the CLSA group and has a background in commercial banking, venture capital, and debt restructuring in senior managerial roles. He's currently the executive chairman of CLSA Capital Partners. Now, CLSA is headquartered in Hong Kong and has offices or representatives in 15 cities across the Asia-Pacific region. Now, Kun Richard also sits on a number of public and private boards. He's an executive committee member of the Hong Kong Coalition of Services Industries, the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce, as well as being a member of the Hong Kong Securities Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Kun Richard Pivis, the executive chairman of CLSA Capital Partners, and he is going to be talking about Asian corporations in the global market. Let's give him a warm welcome. Why not? Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome. Thank you, all of you. I've got to do uh, two things here. The first thing is I've got to work out how to use this slide projector, which uh, I'll do uh, as we go along. Bear with me. Uh, but firstly, um, thank you, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and may I also thank the Securities and Exchange Commission of Thailand and the Nation Group for the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, with you in celebration of the Commission's 20th anniversary. Now, here comes the first bit on the slide. Um, let's try this. Hey, hey. That's great. Um, the world of 2012 is very different from that of 20 years ago when the Commission was formed. Uh, and the demands on regulators have similarly changed. Uh, the world's largest economy, the United States of America, experienced a dramatic change during this period with the Clinton administration's dismantling in 1999 of the Glass-Steagall legislation. And that was an act promulgated 66 years before in 1933 to separate commercial and investment banking during the Great Depression. Grasping this opportunity, the financial services sector embarked on a campaign of global leverages, leverage rather, the consequences of which we'll continue to feel for some years to come. While these are estimates only, outstanding financial leverage reached a multiple in 2008 of more than 20 times the world's approximately $40 trillion annual economic output, a staggering statistic and one that underpins the extent to which the world is still required to deleverage. The opportunity cost of deleveraging results in lower than optimal product productive growth and places additional pressures on the availability of capital for productive investments and on the role of regional capital markets in providing a conduit for sourcing that capital. However, the US is rapidly reinventing itself in today's environment of shifting trading partners and change exchange rates and will continue to play a critical role in global economic activity and growth. The danger lies in pressures on traditional sources of capital for growth, which in itself is an opportunity for Asian capital markets and Thailand's in particular. China, today the world's second largest economy, has risen from a rural-based route to become a truly integrated, mem integrated member of the global economy. But one cannot afford to ignore China without the risk of serious implications for one's economic and political environment. She is truly a double-edged sword which offers opportunity given the right terms and conditions and nowhere more so than in Asia. A command control economy such as China's inevitably experiences capital misallocation and malinvestment, which also holds the potential to send shockwaves through her trading and geographic neighbours. And most significantly, China's closed capital account, which I believe is likely to remain effectively closed for the next decade or so, opens the door 
to opportunity for, for Asia's other capital markets where exchange rates and capital movements have become significantly more transparent in the years since the Asian financial crisis and where financial service sectors, corporates and households remain relatively well capitalised. Now Japan, the third superpower if you like, uh, has endured two decades of serious price deflation and is emerging in better economic health than ever. During the so-called lost decades, Japan constructed two new subway lines, the world's tallest sky, sky tree tower, a new world-class business district in Shiodome on top of the old uh, Shimbashi railway yards and is making similar progress in the Kansai district centred on uh, Osaka. Simply put, Japan is rapidly reinventing itself under this changed economic paradigm and will continue to be one of Asia's most important providers of capital. Sadly, the fiscal-led stimulus programs undertaken by the central government over these two decades have left Japan with a debt-to-GDP ratio in excess of 200 per cent, which will certainly distort capital flows and capital availability for the private sector and productive investment when interest rates inevitably normalise. Europe embarked on one of the most significant experiments the world has seen with the formation of the EU and then the single euro currency. Failure at the time to secure fiscal unity alongside monetary unity led to the inevitable breakdown in fiscal discipline amongst member nations, the consequences of which we are witnessing today. Fortunately, there appears to be sufficient desire to see the EU work to its designers' intentions albeit at the cost of subdued economic growth over the next few years as appropriate institutional frameworks are erected to support the benefits currency unity will continue to deliver. One's only to think of the simplicity with which today one moves goods and services across Europe's borders without the need to deal with separate currencies and border restrictions to experience the benefits and their enduring potential. However, Recapitalisation of Europe's financial services sector and household balance sheets will take time and growth will consequently suffer as private investment is crowded out by the government demands for capital. Finally, Thailand has similarly undergone great change during the past two decades. In particular, the movement from a fixed exchange rate and the consequent malinvestment that resulted in the crisis and capital flight of 1997 is still fresh in our minds. The destruction of nominal incomes resulted in a collapse in domestic consumption and demand and it took until 2004 for Hong Kong, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Taiwan and Thailand for nominal incomes to get back to the 1997 level and exposed a number of fundamental flaws in the structure of Thailand's economy at the time. The subsequent promulgation of a formal bankruptcy uh, law and the training of the judiciary in its implementation, enabling assets to clear at appropriate prices were but one step in the process of restoring domestic savings and confidence. Democratisation and rural empowerment have contributed to a rapid rise in rural consumption and combined with specialised initiatives such as the um, OTOP program have resulted in a material expansion of the rural tax net, engaging more of rural Thai economy into the formal economy. Thailand, albeit with significant reliance on the automobile and electronic export sectors, is in a far better balanced economy or economic state today than she was two decades ago. Of course, much remains to be done <laughs> as is the case with all uh, developing and mature economies, as we've seen in the case of Japan. But the commonality underlining the inherent dynamic nature of all economies is the role of capital. It's here the Secur Securities and Exchange Commission's role comes to the fore. Capital is a scarce resource, and the extent to which regulators can assist in the efficient access to and allocation of that scarce resource, the better will be the chances of resultant productive investment, in turn leading to a better balanced economy, more able to withstand the inevitable shocks, both internal and external, that will occur in the future. 
Regulators have traditionally focused on that function, regulation, and often to the chagrin of the underlying needs of those they regulate. In a period of massive deleverage, such as the world is witnessing today, it's natural human nature to concentrate on the past and not the future. Humanity is within its comfort zone, looking back at the root causes of any disaster and then attempting to structure frameworks that will prevent such dis disasters from reoccurring. Unfortunately, history shows that such attempts are futile. This uh, hindsight bias is an unavoidable consequence reflecting actions taken in the past based on the information that was available at that time, which in the light of today appear flawed. However, regulators are similarly not possessed of perfect information, and the regulatory framework that's created is by definition bound to be flawed. This is particularly the case when public interests compete with those of the private sector. Effective regulators recognise this and structure their regulations with sufficient flexibility to encourage diversity and hopefully avoid, avoid homogenisation of sections of the economy which leaves them particularly vulnerable to systemic distress when inevitable crises occur. It's a difficult line to walk but with encouraging opportunities such as this forum that the SEC appears to be positioning itself at the forefront in thinking in this regard. I'll give you one example um, in the banking sector in the US which serves as a, a really good illustration of a flawed approach to regulation. In 1933, the US Reconstruction Finance Corporation, created by the famous uh, Herbert Hoover, bailed out the Continental Illinois National Bank. Uh, the bank's ba balance sheet was impaired by bad loans uh, owed from Chicago utilities. The cost was $50 million. In the 1980s, the FDIC bailed out Continental Illinois again, $4 billion this time. And more recently, Bank of America required what was left of Continental Illinois and Merrill Lynch <coughs> with $45 billion of support from the Fed. The Fed was also created in 1913. I think I've gone somewhere crazy on this slideshow, haven't I? That doesn't matter. Where are we up to? About here, I guess. Um, now, the point of the illustration is just to show that regulation failed to prevent the failure of Continental Illinois time and again, and the guy who paid for this was the American taxpayer. So the very dynamism and creativity of mankind ensures that ways around restrictive barriers will be found. It's therefore incumbent upon regulators to recognise that these big efforts to repair holes in dams will inevitably turn out to be wasteful expenditure of limited financial and human resource. In fact, regulators are at their most effective when they create enabling frameworks that encourage innovation within clear and transparent boundaries. Now, regulation arises from society's behavioural expectations of its members. Regulation is cultural by definition, and regulators reply upon, rely upon certain remedies when acceptable behaviour is exceeded. But regulation is ultimately cultural, and those being regulated are expected to abide by generally accepted and well-promulgated codes of behaviour. In the case of financial services, one key function is encouraging the role of capital as an enabler and facilitator in the production and exchange of goods and services to the benefit of society and its members. The private sector has been repeatedly shown to make better productive investment decisions than government. After all, when the private sector fails, its shareholders and debt providers pay the price, and the assets that were created exchange hands at a market price, not at a price influenced by special interest groups. So achieving a timely and relevant regulatory framework is the mark of an effective regulator. However, it appears there is a disconnect between the efforts of regulators and actual market experience. Since the Asian financial crisis, there have been more than 40 listings by ASEAN corporates on non-ASEAN stock exchanges raising some $4 billion in new capital. Now, in some cases, there were sort of special case in instances, particularly in oil and gas. Um, but in many others, when you have a look at those uh, companies, it does appear that the particular ASEAN exchange was not competitively up to the standards of the winning exchange, 
and it drove its natural or its home-based customers away. Hopefully I'll get the slide right this time. <laughs> um, now I talk about the Greater Mekong Delta because the demands for capital and the role of capital markets will be a prominent feature for Thailand as this, dec uh, as this delta undergoes a dramatic industrial expansion over the next two decades. Now China is, Ch sorry, Ch Thailand is uniquely placed as the gateway of the Greater Mekong Delta and will see a dynamic expansion of interconnectivity, roads, rail networks, crisscrossing the delta from Vietnam in the east, Myanmar and India in the west, and of course China in the north. Now plans are well underway for this interconnectivity, linked to the movement of people, goods and services across the delta. The infrastructural development will spawn a myriad of satellite industrial activity, which in turn will require access to capital. The potential benefits, particularly to the rural poor, from productive investment are enormous but will require capital. I have to repeat that. Development requires capital. Much of it will be raised in public markets. So capital needs for this huge capital um, expenditure expansion will both transform, transform the way public companies approach capital markets and the form of those future capital raisings. And this development will place new demands on, upon public markets and in turn upon the regulators. So added to this process of change and increase in complexity is the need for capital to be deployed across na national boundaries in new and creative ways. Now we're confident both private and public sectors will construct appropriate mechanisms and vehicles to meet this demand and are delighted to see the Securities and Exchange Commission is both aware of this dynamic and has embraced the need for change in its traditional approach to the capital markets it regulates. The cost of losing corporates to non-domestic exchanges are twofold. Firstly, there is lost revenue to domestic bankers and the domestic exchange, which in turn de-skills local capital market participants. And then secondly, there's the, the commensurate decline in liquidity, similarly reducing both the competit competitiveness and skills base of the local market. So both are to be avoided wherever possible as domestic corporates suffer and in turn domestic productive investment opportunities are often missed. Now the world's a very different place um, to that of two decades ago. Belief that more regulation is a good thing and that risks can be both quantified and controlled has led to an increasingly regulated global financial services sector. So banking, it's an activity that evolved from a simple intermediation of savings and investment into a fully fledged fractional reserve system transgressing national boundaries is increasingly regulated by rules in attempts to apply risk asset assessment rules and capital adequacy rules to ever growing balance sheets. Be they Baal or Dodd-Frank rules, the effect is the same. Delineation of the functions of commercial banking and investment banking will grow and this of course was the intention of Glass-Steagall a century ago and bankers will continue to find ways to get across that disintermediation. Moral hazard, too big to fail, these words are alive and well in the thinking of global lawmakers and are unlikely to disappear. The social costs of a megabank failure are too difficult for politicians to cope with and so they do what comes naturally. They design and add yet more regulation in attempts to minimise the risk of large institutional failures. Forward thinking observers will recognise that such regulatory frameworks, whilst well intentioned, are inherently reactive in nature and design and consequently flawed by the time they're promulgated and they're bound to fail. Erecting a fence around risk management is likely to have as much success as the Berlin Wall ultimately did. It's only through a more holistic approach to regulation that appropriate cultures of risk awareness and sensitivity will evolve. A cultural shift starts with the community's leadership and its lawmakers. Enforcement is best used as a threat that is rarely used and whose main purpose is to remind sectoral participants of the consequences of breaching society's norms. Seekers of capital look to stock exchanges, local, regional and international for the, the exchange that can best meet their capital needs. This places demands on flexibility and creativity on the shoulders of all exchanges. I've had a career on both sides of the debt and equity fence 
and understand the need for exchanges to be flexible in matching the needs of savers with those of investors. There is no one size fits all. The more dynamic exchanges are those that recognise the need for diversity, for the particular needs of their investment community and the recognition of risk amongst savers, those looking for a place to place capital with firms for productive investment, and investors, those corporations looking for productive investment opportunities. Needs are different and changing. For an exchange to be a productive element in this in intermediation of savers and investors requires it to be sufficiently flexible within a framework of sufficient clarity that participants will ex accept this change over, over competitor exchanges. Unfortunately, all risk elements are rarely within the gambit of the SEC. Politics has a nasty habit of interfering from time to time. But for those elements within its control, an effective exchange can successfully differentiate itself from its peers, given the appropriate regulatory framework within which to work. Investment decisions are best made by the private sector, but the private sector needs an appropriate enabling regulatory environment in which to work. Sensible regulation and removal of unnecessary regulation are keys for success. Destruction of so-called red tape should be front and center on the desk of every regulator. Thai corporations with the appropriate facilitation can gain comparative advantage in their investment decisions and actions given appropriate nurturing and access to capital. This does not mean government handouts, which inevitably serve to encourage wasteful capital deployment, but does mean a simple and easily navigable path to gain access to capital. Thailand's policy framework requires sufficient flexibility that competitive advantage, doing it better, faster than cheaper than one's competitors, can be enabled, turning that advantage into a comparative and sustainable advantage, which in turn encourages successive rounds of investment. Policies that favour interest groups over the broader economy will only add to the depth of any disruption. The Commission has a significant and meaningful role to play in shaping the most enabling access to capital environment to assist Thai corporates and entrepreneurs as they strive for success. So of the 40 or so listings I mentioned earlier, roughly half of them went to the UK, to the London Stock Exchange and the AIM. 15% went to Hong Kong, to uh, the main board and the GEM board, and the balance went to the Australian Stock Exchange. So when we have a very superficial examination of the timing, the amount raised and the sectors, it indicates to me that most of these listings should have been catered to by their domestic exchange. Competitive forces seem to have driven the issuers to other exchanges. So this has observations for an economy because the more robust the corporate sector and domestic capital market environment, the better an economy is able to withstand the inevitable headwinds from internal and external shocks, and the better society will enjoy the benefit productive growth can deliver. So as I wrap up now, I'm reminded of some of the key lessons from the uh, Asian crisis in the late 1990s, and I'll just run over them quickly. Floating exchange rates are essential. A floating exchange rate allows investing capital to make more rational decisions because interest rates will reflect underlying inflationary expectations and as such you get a more accurate measure of return. Capital needs to know it will be subject to market rules and conditions so it can be allocated according to the underlying investment opportunities and not exploited by artificial barriers. Providing and appropriately administering Thailand's capital markets are a key ingredient in the official functioning of access to capital. Capital is also open to different investment opportunities and knowledge that capital may flow freely across national borders is an important element in capital's risk evaluation process. Disintermediation of the banking sector is important if the corporate sector is allowed to source capital at remarket rates reflecting the true cost of that capital. When a large amount of market cap is in the hands of the banking sector, which is the case in much of Asia, competition for capital materially alters its price and crowds out other capital users. So too does the involvement of the banking sector in its allocation. 
the ultimate user of capital, the corporation, usually makes much better decisions about where it should be invested. A mature bond market is also essential, so interest rates can act as an indicator of real returns over time offered by an economy. This gives central bankers an effective tool for managing liquidity and it gives corporates access to long-term debt and turns savings into a long-term asset. Achieving the degree of efficiency needed to meet future capital needs is a challenge, particularly when the application of that capital is likely to be in cross-border investment. Inter-exchange cooperation and agreement is part of that solution, albeit in a competitive environment where all exchanges are competing in their own right for that role. It's a difficult tightrope to walk, but the outputs of a collaborative approach are likely to outweigh a series of individual initiatives undertaken in isolation. It's very encouraging to see the Commission recognise and promote closer collaboration with regional exchanges as long as the independence and strength of the Thai Stock Exchange is not compromised in that process. Clear rules and regulations and their supervision and enforcement ensure the economy is supported by a robust financial services sector. A technically insolvent banking sector, as we are witnessing in Europe at the moment, is useless. Impaired balance sheets mean there's no credit creation, only debt and the loss of confidence by banks' own lending officers who know there's nothing to lend just compound the problem. Supervisors and regulators need to be sure their regulations assist in the creation of risk assets other than the property sector, which of course can be blamed for much of Asia's 1990s meltdown. Markets work in both directions, both up and down, profit and loss. And the beauty of effective markets is that neither is necessarily bad. Losses provide the opportunity for assets to clear at acceptable prices to buyer and seller, for example. It's when markets are inhibited from working due to inappropriate regulation that price signals are wasted, assets fail to clear, and the population unnecessarily suffers. Sensible and fast access to capital through the public markets and sensible regulation surrounding the behaviour of those markets are fundamental elements in this equation of expansion of the Thai economy's risk asset base. Market discipline is the guiding mantra. An economy must be able to defend itself against external disruptions. Encouragement of healthy domestic demand through exploitation of its inherent comparative advantages and latent human resources is one such way. Encouraging and facilitating product investment is one mantra well within the Securities and Exchange Commission's mandate to its people. And here the SEC has the opportunity create, to create meaningful comparative advantage through its approach to regulation. Setting the bar too, le too low will lead to complacency and disrespect, while a bar too high drives business away from Thailand. This is a balancing act but the first step in achieving this, this balancing act is to recognise that regulation in isolation is not the appropriate panacea. And that's already been taken in the form of this seminar. Providing the right environment for capital formation and access to capital for growth is a critical function and one within the mandate of the Commission as avoidance of systemic disruption, disruption to the Thai economy is the best way to ensure a healthy and robust economy to the benefit of all ties. I apologise for taking so much of your time this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Richard Pivas. No apologies needed. We appreciate you being here with us very, very much indeed. Once again, Mr. Richard Pivas, the chairman of CLSA Capital Partners Hong Kong, telling us all about Asian corporations in the global market, addressing the transition that we saw in the past two decades, as well as highlighting that the spotlight is very much on China and the movements 
that China does make will send ripple effects all over the world as well. Now, he also put into perspective, in a nutshell, that there are other dominating economies of today, being the US and Japan as well. He also summed up the EU financial crisis, the Asian crisis as well, and also talked about Thailand being the gateway